Hello, everyone. Today we have a very special interview with Mr. Richard Dynan. Richard is the CEO of Pulsar, which was formerly Applied Fusion Systems, which was founded four years ago. And he lives in London, England. So with that, I hope you enjoy the interview. Thanks. Can you introduce yourself to people who don't know who you are? I am the CEO of a company which was formerly called Applied Fusion and is now Pulsar Fusion. We have a research facility in the United Kingdom for fusion energy. There are not very many private fusion enterprises that are properly funded, but we're one of those people who feel very privileged to have a really good facility and a really good opportunity. So other than that, I'm a, an amateur I'm not a, a professional physicist by training at all. My um, expertise, I guess, lies in the financing side of things, uh, which, in my view, is just as crucial as the science if you're trying to do this privately. I agree with that statement. When did you first become interested in fusion? I, I actually left school at 16. I was one of those kids who... My school reports always said if he really focused, be, he'd be able to do this, but he doesn't seem to be as interested. And... I've always had an absolute ability to really focus down on something, but I've got to truly be interested in it. I left school and started up a few, a few companies, most of which went sort of you know, failing. I actually, the great thing about leaving school early is you get time to fail. I got a good 10 years of failing at businesses, and that's so important because by the time I was starting my first business, starting to get to go well, a lot of my friends were out of university, and you know, nothing teaches you so well as the university of life. I'm really, really great experience for me. But to answer your question, when did fusion come into my life? I've always been interested in technology. It's always been what I'm naturally good at, is, build, is building things with my hands. And my priority was to make money. And once I actually had spent 10 years trying to make money and actually made a little bit of money, I thought, well, with this money, what do I want to do that I actually love? So rather than money being, I know it sounds like one of those talks of things, do what you love and the money will follow. I actually thought, well, what do I love? I love building things. I love I loved tech. And um, I set up a, a technology firm, actually a robotics firm, and found that we were building technology that other people had built. There's nothing really special about what we were doing, the robotics we were making. But it was very hard because like any business, it's competitive. And when you did build something, a product that you're very proud of, you found that it wasn't really novel because people go, oh, you've built a um, XY axis robot and there's nothing special about that. But you think, well, you know, all the work and research and, and effort we put into it. There's so much competition nowadays. And I thought, if you're going to put yourself through all the effort of setting up a company, and you're going to put yourself through all the hoops anyway, and money isn't the, 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 is your first and foremost, you're not just trying to make money, you want to do what you love, you might as well go for it. <laughs> because, we, you know, we don't live forever. And, okay, business has got to be about money. But it, it also has got to be about what you really enjoy. And I now I can say I really enjoy fusion. I love fusion. I love working on it. I, it's a privilege to be working on it. How did I get into it? After the, the robotics company, I learned how difficult it was to prototype and fabricate machinery. So to build expensive, complex machines and you know, set up in industrial facilities around them. I actually started collecting large meteorites, really, really big ones. And the funny thing about a meteorite is actually, in a funny way, it is the most crude evidence of fusion because it's iron that's been cooked from hydrogen in a star. And, you know, everyone, people say, OK, everything around you is made of fusion. And you think, well, it's, you know, as a result of fusion, you know, 75% of the universe is hydrogen from the very beginning and still is today and the rest is helium. Um, everything else is basically cooked in stars. So, these, so fusion is the element cooker. But it's difficult to feel it, look around, and it's, everything is so uniform. But when you look at a meteorite, you know, it looks like a piece of a star. It's a chunk of fusion. And I just started hiring physicists to teach me a little bit more about where are we with fusion. And I had what I think people still have today, a view that fusion was one of those things that needed to be cracked and that we we're waiting for somebody to have a, like a eureka moment and crack fusion. And it started off as just a sort of curiosity, but the more scientists that started teaching me about it, the more I started realizing, well, hang on, I could apply my business ethic, the, the fundraising side of this, because it sounds like fundraising is the biggest problem in the sector. And 
I suddenly felt that rather than being a plasma physicist, what, what is required here is somebody who can get, a, get the funds together for something that isn't actually going to give you a yield in, in five to seven years. So it's a specialist skill set that was required, and it was my skill set, and it was one that is surrounding a topic that I was beginning to love. So that was a slow realization on your part that this was going to be important and that you could play a very big role in making it happen. Would you, is that fair to say that? Well, there's just so many brilliant physicists out there. And, you know, this is one of those technologies where, you know, we know how to do fusion. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. You know, in, in JET, the Joint European Taurus Reactor, in 1997, scientists extracted 16 megawatts of energy from a tokamak is an amazing achievement and really is why they've put 13 billion euros into the ITER project or ITER project if you're French or a lot of people call it ITER now. And we're getting to grips with fusion. There's a lot of innovations that we still need before we pass the level where it gets quite efficient. But, you know, we don't need to make a perfect fusion reactor. Scientists don't really, you know, humans don't really make perfect machines. If you look at the latest Ferrari engine, it's not perfect it's amazing but it's it's not perfect but what people have got to get their heads around is sort of fusion reactor that, that works quite well is still better than anything else we've got so we're in a stage where we, we know what we're doing ITER will achieve a, a Q equals 10 or actually it will achieve more like a Q equals 15 result 15 times the energy gain when it turns on um, and then it, it'll just be about making them smaller and to do that we need we need lots of little innovations and the only way we're going to get that is either you leave it to the government for till 2055 when they plan to set demo up the demonstration power station or somebody needs to be able to prototype these things just like we prototype anything else problem is no one will give us the money to do that because a fusion has got a very bad reputation of being you know a, a slow starter or false starts and you've had the cold fusion um announcements all these sort of people i think the public perception is they're so used to it fusion being linked with false hope um, so investors don't like that. Also, it's got the word nuclear in it, which is um, also not, it's, you know, the, it's one of the <laughs> worst possible words. So people really struggle to raise the money to, to, to do these innovations. And, and most importantly, if you go to a fund and say, hey, look, we want to start prototyping fusion reactors, they'll say, well, how am I going to get a return? And for five years, you know, most funds need to get a return between five and seven years. It's just, there's just no way of doing that. So to have the money to prototype fusion reactors, you need to really, you need to really have a very, um, very, very practiced um, method of raising money, more so than being a plasma physicist, as I said. So I felt, yeah, that this, this is, I, I could raise money for these scientists. And I believe that somebody needs to be not just building one device and hoping it's going to crack fusion, but just building a machine, looking at, you know, say, okay, we're learning from it. We, we've been it. We build another one. We learn from that. We, we build another one. And that's, that's what prototyping is. It's not all about theoretical physics. I mean, theoretical physics is obviously essential, but we need to build it. You need to get practical and that costs money. I see. Can you take us back to when you first founded Applied Fusion Systems Now, Pulsar Fusion? When specifically was it founded? So I, I think in 2014, I had hired some physicists and we'd been to ITER and we'd been to Cullen and, and I just thought, well, we can contribute somewhere to this technology and I'd like to be able to contribute to the sector. And I had a, a meeting, I, I managed to track down the chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority in the UK, who's, a, who's now in charge of Princeton, called Professor Steve Cowley, who was very, very kind in giving me some of his time. And he just fascinated me. I and mean, he's a really, truly gifted theoretical physicist. And when we have our first fusion burn, he will be present. Not I'm saying us, but when humanity uh, does go over that line, you can be sure that Steve Cowley will be somewhere behind the scenes. He really inspired me. And I thought I can raise money where scientists can't. And so immediately I set up a corporation called Applied Fusion in the UK and we started having, you know, opening up conversations with the regulators and just understanding the sector a little bit. And 
I said, look, I want to meet everybody in charge of these devices, and I want to see if they're going to tell me, hey, look, the problem with Fusion is you need to, we need to work out the X, Y, Z, and then, and then it'll all work. But what actually the, the answer I kept getting was is we will get there. It's just we're betting on this enormous ISO reactor, which is parts being built in China, Japan. It's based in France. We're building trucks, which are bigger than any other trucks that have been made with roads that have got to be big enough to hold them all. And they post pictures of their giant magnets with 50 people standing inside them. And that's not necessarily something to be proud of. This thing is, you know, it took them 10 years to decide whether to build it in Provence or Japan. So there's been so much delay and time wasting when the science is there and the frustration is that someone needs to be able to raise the money. So the first thing is I set up the company and started investing in it myself and mainly in just educating myself for four years. I, I spent with physicists just flying around the world, tracking down the best brains in, in fusion and seeing if the same message, which I, which I did. It's a very interesting way to put up together a company and to start thinking about something. I guess when you start putting money into something, it start, it's, it's hugely tax efficient to start doing it under a corporation. Because I thought I could end up spending money on scientists and flights and, and research and actually then find out that someone's going to say to me, hey, you don't understand, there's, there's some kind of problem that we, we just literally is a brick wall. And then in which case I'd have to my investment would be a complete loss. But I needed to understand if, if that was the case, is there a brick wall problem into, or is it just funding and, and trial and error? And I, I think it's that idea. Was that when you started writing the, the Fusion Age? No. When I, then, I got very, then I got very passionate about it because <laughs> people love talking about Fusion, but they, they didn't want to fund it uh, because you know, it's all a little bit too good to be true and stars in your eyes type stuff and they just thought well, that's a great story but I'm, I'm not going to give you a huge amount of money i'm not going to give you 50 million quid also you try and get a funder to learn about fusion most people don't know the difference between fusion and fission i'm saying there's nothing wrong with that it's just you can get way too close to something and in the fusion world people know so much about fusion they forget how little everybody else knows about it. And you've got to take the time to, to talk to everybody and explain it if you can't explain something simply then you probably don't understand it and the relationship between the, the scientists and the funders was awful. Scientists were writing papers and churning out papers, and the funders, they just weren't seeing a, a, a route to fund it. So I got, I got really quite passionate, and, and I thought, if I'm a venture capitalist, or if I'm a private equity, or an angel, and someone comes to me and they, they pitch their life out about fusion, and I think about it, how am I going to educate myself? How am I going to do my due diligence? If you go onto Amazon and you type in nuclear fusion as a book, you'll find enormous books on gyrokinetics and plasma physics written by two PhDs, and no angel investor is going to read that. These books are £100, they're enormous and fat, $100, and any sort of interested investor is going to open the page and he's going to come across the Lawson criteria, and he's going to shut it. He's going to be put off by the size of it. So I thought something to do is put together a child's story about fusion, a really short book which can be read in the bath. Then I can give it with the business plans to funders and say, look, it's so short, this book, that you're going to have to flick through it in, in an hour or two. And it's just give you the story. And if you're interested after that, you can go and study further. You can delve as deep as you want after that. But the little book was just so that a busy finance guy could flick through it in, in an evening and they did. So I spoke to many very, very wealthy funders and they took the book and they did flick through it. It wasn't head too heavy on physics and they came back with a lot of questions. And I knew that that little book was the right thing to have done. Now I'm actually going to probably rewrite it because I'm now looking back at it and thinking it's so short and actually a lot, of, a lot of people have bought it. And I feel that, you know, I only put it on Amazon to sort of learn about how Amazon Books works. And now I Every time someone writes an article on Fusion, I sell a load of Fusion books. Because again, people go, I'd like to learn about Fusion. And they see all these heavy, heavy books filled with research. And they go, well, I'm not a plasma physicist, but I'd like to learn a little bit more about it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably rewrite it and go back and take some more time over it. But the book was a, a really big success, actually. Congratulations on the book and how well it's done. You're absolutely right. There is a huge gap between what is done in the lab and what the rest of the public and specifically finance people think about fusion. Can you go into any detail about what Pulsar is currently doing? Yeah, no, I can. The, the problem with the funding is that people would go to a investor and say, I'm a scientist, I'm a 
plasma physicist. And I have been working at a government facility for 10 years. And I now know that fusion reactors are going to start turning on quite soon. And, and we, know how to, we know how to make them. And I would like £50 million. Pounds. The problem with, with your investor is he would say, OK, well, I sort of believe this guy's credentials. But I don't want to back £50 million. Pounds. This guy has got, a, I don't know, a, some kind of tokamak, spherical tokamak with a little twist. Or whatever it is, he's got some clever design. But he's like, I don't want to put 40 million quid into this design and then find out that someone in Princeton or someone in um, China or someone has gone and, you know, what if Lockheed Martin turn on a magnetic mirror device or, or a, a Trialpha or for the investor, it's you're asking them to bet 50 million quid on one horse. And that's never a good investment. And so it falls apart. And with Pulsar, what we did is we said, what we're going to do is we are, and I can't go into exactly what we're doing, but we are going to take a view that ITER is going to not just achieve its remit of Q equals 10, but surpass it. It's going to do better than Q equals 10. And when it does, the newspapers are going to be sitting around going, OK, here we go, fusion energy. This is a, one of the most complex machines ever built by man. It's an enormous machine, ITER. Amazing. And the press will really see, for the first time, they will be able to, to write, humanity has, we've done it. We've, we have... I hate the word, the term, but cracked fusion. And then there'll be headlines and everybody will be talking about fusion energy and, and how we've done it. But people say, what does that mean? Well, ITER is only the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. So it won't even, it's not a power station. So you can't really do a lot with it. And it costs so much money. And there'll suddenly be a huge amount of money because for once it's been proven to work. And, and that money has got to go into the right kind of corporations. You can't set up a fusion company when ITER works. You've got to be doing it now. It still raises eyebrows. And you, say, you, know, you talk about fusion energy now, people go, mm, it's a bit left field. But after ITER, everybody was saying, oh, fusion's a good idea. Fusion's a good idea. You know, that's too late then. So, so we've taken the view that ITER is going to work. And we said to our, our investors, we are going to assume that it is going to be the catalyst for an enormous amount of investment. But it won't happen. This money isn't probably going to be available until ITER turns on. So in the meantime, we are going to invest in several technologies, which we know, no matter what reactors succeed, they'll be using these technologies, whether it be linear devices or stellarators or tokamak or some new device. They will all have to use the innovations that Pulsar focuses on. So almost saying in a gold rush, sell shovels. Yeah, we're going to dig for gold too, but we are going to protect your investment so that if you back Pulsar, and some Chinese startup goes and breaks even, you'd be sure as hell that that Chinese startup is then going to start buying our components because they're going to need them because we have a really good portfolio of fusion components. And that changes the game because investors can get behind that. Pulsar is, can't say exactly what the synergies are because of the, to protect our own investors, but that changes the, the proposition significantly. And it still funds you to be able to build a, a reactor, but it means that you're, you've got a plan B and a plan C. Assuming fusion is going to be the dominant power source by 2100, which is the popular opinion of, of governments, that's 7 trillion annually, well, the money's got to come out of coal and fission into fusion. You capture a very small percentage of that, and it's worth doing, but no investor wants to back one attempt, especially if it's going to cost, you know, 40 million quid, and it could be that that machine isn't, isn't right. And they're not going to read and study about it. They've ultimately got to believe in the scientists in front of them. And there's so many scientists out there who are brilliant fusion uh, scientists. And they're all saying, well, I believe in this device. I mean, even if you go back 70 years, you know, you've got Spitzer and you've got all these different designs. And they're quite furiously against each other. I think in time, many fusion devices will be able to, to work. But going back to the analogy of engines, we only have one engine now because the engine design we've got, it works. And you could probably make an engine work in other formations, but once you've got something that works and that people are happy to, to work with, then you can improve on that. I personally think that Tokamaks are probably a very likely candidate. I think the Stellarator is an amazing machine, but I can't really see it being a power station. Maybe it'll be a, a mixture of both, but we want to bet the ranch on one of them. That's an excellent business model. I think it really diversifies the risk and de-risks the whole proposition for an investor. Did you try some other models first and then settle on that one, or was it...? Uh, like everything in my life, it's been a, a product of six years of failure. So a lot of 
business pitches and a lot of talking to funders and listening to them. And the reason I said I wrote the book is because I could see that they were interested, but they went home and they looked up Fusion and they lost interest. So listening to where the funding was, was going wrong was just so crucial, rather than just saying, oh, next pitch. And I don't think, say, you should always listen to everybody, because if, if you go to one pitch and someone says, oh, your valuation's wrong, the next guy goes, oh, well, your business name's wrong, I don't like that. The next guy goes, oh, well, I think you're the wrong person for it. I mean, you can ignore all of that. But what you've got to listen to is their fear. You've got to appreciate the investor's view. The world, unfortunately, is controlled by ability to buy assets. And if you don't think about it that way and you're too into the science, then the funders aren't going to keep up. And you could be right. You could be the best plasma physicist in the world, but you've got to appreciate that without the money, you can't have the scientists. You won't have the buildings, the devices. The prototyping is very, very expensive. You can buy the physicists, but concluded in my little book that the way to cracking fusion was to crack the finance. So you essentially have built two very large communities of relationships, some with physicists and some with financial people. You're at this crossroads. You're basically bridging these two very different communities. It's kind of a unique position. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think what you say is true. It, it is a unique position. But for me, I just feel very privileged to have the facilities. We have so many people writing to our company every day saying, I will work for you for free because they want access. This technology just you need to cost a fortune. And, and we come into Pulsar and we've got the best technology and the best computers and the most amazing devices. And it's just such a, a privilege. For me, it's, it's a real passion. And the technology, I believe it's not just about power stations. One day we'll turn a fusion reactor and it'll power our home, but it's humans coming out of combustion. We're so used to, to energy being something we buy because we set fire to something, you release very little energy from it. But every day the sun is giving us huge amounts of heat and light and we, we don't pay for it. Energy is actually in an abundance in the universe. But on Earth, when you set fire to everything, we're sort of enslaved by it. The, the book, sorry, I don't, I don't mean to plug the book. I'm not trying to plug the book. In fact, I'm actually asking them not to buy the book, so I'm not happy with it yet. <laughs> but uh, it, it was called the Fusion Age, because I see the technology as a new age. It's coming out of the Stone Age. It's, we're coming into the Fusion Age. And it will be our generation, this generation, that does it. Because ITA's going to work. And we're on the line now. We're on the line of humans being able to build a star on Earth. And that's an amazing time to be alive and to be involved in that technology and to have that tech and unlimited access to it is, is a privilege. Yeah, to get involved in this is really thrilling. What is the, the milestones for Pulsar over, say, the next five years? Are you going to work in tandem with Eater? Are you... No, it relies more on the funders than it does on the scientists. I think with the right money, I would like to think a private company could beat ITER. I mean, money no object. It would be a wonderful thing if a private company were to achieve. It would be very wonderful if a private company could do it, but they have got to really um, have a big cash pile. And also, the other thing is that these fusion companies, they're trying to use a different type of reactor. The tokamak, that you can benefit from almost a century of research and very promising results and I think reinventing the wheel can be a very silly thing to do because tokamaks are going to work or a variation of tokamaks say will definitely be the chosen I'm not saying other devices won't work too if you think about power stations and people that will actually want to use fusion look at the Windelstein I mean that is a brilliant device and wow I'm proud of humanity that we made it but do you think BP will be able to make Windelsteins and turn them into I just, it needs to be something more industrially standardized and, and to be able to plow the money into building these devices. We've got the D-shaped tokamak now and that's had great results with it, but we haven't tried so many other formations. We understand that plasma doesn't really like being held in confinement in a metal tin and supercomputers are teaching us how we can stabilize it. But, you know, a lot of this stuff is done by universities on a shoestring by someone that's more interested in publishing a paper than actually having a practical result. If you look at a lot of the innovations like radiative cooling and H mode, a, a lot of this wasn't actually theorized. It, it wasn't sort of theoretical physics. It was done by just building stuff, just building hardware, turning it on and working out what's wrong with it. And you need to get practicals. When you look for financing, people have talked about strategic partners versus angels. 
versus venture capital. Could you see uh, Pulsar long term partnering with like a large energy company, for instance, or do you do you well, think it needs to be a standalone company? We're not really. I mean, look, power stations has, has got to be a big part of fusion, but there's so many other technologies to be had out of fusion. And the original company is called Applied Fusion because it's applying fusion to all, to the sector, potential uses for it. But if you actually go and sit in a business forum for ITA, it's like the perfect storm of bureaucracy. There's way too many people. It is a nightmare. Typically, a small company will do a job much quicker than a large company, and a large company will do it quicker than a government. But keeping things small is, is always good. Small and, and agile. The fewer shareholders you have, the better. You know, so you always need one liquidity as well. We have, at the moment, two shareholders in Pulsar. And I think we're alone in having a fully up and running fusion company with two shareholders. We could have raised 50,000 from one guy, 100,000 from the next guy, 500,000. We'd end up with 200 shareholders, but that's a logistical nightmare. You have people on the phone talking, saying, I'm not going to sell my shares. I think they're worth 10 million. And oh, I shouldn't sign that shareholders agreement. And I don't think it's in my interest. And I think you misrepresented this. That just comes with it. So our goal will be to keep our shareholders. We will be picking, doing the right deals. And we'd like to be doing fewer of them. Just do the, the right ones. And... I'm a big believer in that if you can make a fusion burn in a reactor, then energy is one thing, but also there's desalinization and there's propulsion. If we're ever going to leave our solar system, we need a very fast exhaust feeds. And we really are going to be a civilization that travels for the stars, then going to be fusion that takes us there. That certainly sets you apart from, say, a General Fusion or a TAE Technologies. They were small, and then they went corporate and took on many, many shareholders. And I think yeah. it's a different business model, and you're applying it to this space, which really has never been done before. Also, space travel, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But also, you talk about our people, talk about Alpha Centauri and these places for like, it's, if, we knew, we, if this is ever going to be real, then um, we have to, it has to be Fusion. So we've come to the end of the interview. Is there anything else that, that you feel that people listening to this should know about Fusion or should, something you really want to get across? We love to talk to everybody. And we have a pretty much open door policy. If people want to get in touch, we, there's an error on our website that says you tell us what you're interested in and you know, see if we can apply it. We have a blog. And I think the younger generations say that they don't have the whole memory of Chernobyl and you say nuclear to my parents, you know, for example, it's, it's always bad news. And that stigma, I don't think, applies to the, to the younger generation. And they're just interested. They're like, okay, so, you know, when are we going to get it? They're not so skeptical. They're almost expecting it. So, yeah, we want to be educational and we say to people, do reach out and get in touch. We love talking about it and it's, not, it's, it's a technology, it's everybody's technology. And uh, it's just really exciting to be to be so involved in it okay i think that's where we'll leave it i want to thank you very much for the interview and i hope that this podcast can serve as a platform to help pulsar and help fusion in general and help get the message out about what you're doing and garner support from the right people matt thank you very much for your time